thank you very much for that introduction. I must say your clothes are not so bad either. <laughs> uh, I'm so privileged to be allowed to, to be here. And last year, the, the, uh, the, there, there was no in-person summit, as you know. And, but I was at that time privileged to receive this uh, award from the patient safety movement. And that I did as a clinician. Uh, and as was told, I had been had many international roles, including being the president of a half a million anesthesiologists in 150 countries. But I was thinking when I was given the task to talk to you today, what should I do? Should I speak about the world and the lack of access and the unsafe care people get all over in the world in, in third world countries or so? Or should I take my other role? Being at the front end, the clinician on the floor. And we went for the person, my, my, my clinician role. But uh, the, the the Patient Safety Movement Foundation has meant so much, and one of the good things is that it's bringing together all stakeholders. We all want to work together to improve things. That's very special. And if you look at this, one of the uh, guiding principles, promote respect, dignity, compassion, and love in all actions and behaviors. How bold is that? What organization dares to take the word love into their mouth? Well, this does. But I'll take you back to the, the beginning. I think uh, some of you have heard my story before. Many of us who are engaged in patient safety, we have our own stories, I found out. And if you look at me, it's a, a drawing made by my mother. When, how old do you think I was, if you look at the picture? Yeah, well, actually, I was four. And as you can see, I was not a very happy four-year-old. <laughs> but why was I not happy? Well, when I was three and a half, my, uh, I had a little baby brother. who had, uh, was, uh, He had some malformations. And uh, nobody could look after my sister and me. Then my mother knew that she had to be in the hospital with my brother if he should have any chance to survive. My father had to work, and I said, OK, uh, I'll look after my sister. And that's my first memories, that I was sitting with my sister, who was two, outside the hospital on the bench waiting for my mother, who was inside the hospital waiting, caring for my brother. He died of a medical error. When my mother had warned, we have heard the story of Martha earlier today, it struck a note with me because that was my mother also fighting for her baby back in 1961. And he died. And that was the end of my childhood, actually. I stopped playing. I wanted to, this girl here, the older sister, she had decided she wanted to make a change in this world. She wanted to be a doctor and to help people. And she had learned one lesson. There is no hysterical mother. OK, well, there are some hysterical mothers, but that's a diagnosis of exclusion. Mothers, you should always, as a healthcare person, listen to relatives who are concerned about their loved ones. And that has stayed with me ever since. And uh, I've, I became an anesthesiologist, which is the best medical specialty, because, <laughs> no, but honestly, you can use your head to make decisions, you can use your hands to do procedures, and you can use your heart to approach them. And imagine those patients, they give their lives into your hands. I have to take care of them when they are unconscious. Isn't that very special that they do that? Well, so I became the president of the European Board of Anesthesiologists, and we decided uh, at some point to make the Helsinki Declaration on Patient Safety in Anesthesiology. And this was back in 2010 when it was launched. And what's interesting with that declaration is that, that as we are doing here in this movement, is that it describes the role of all stakeholders and that we had to work together to make a change. And it was launched in 2010 and uh, together with the ESA. And at this moment, I want to pay tribute 
to the then president of the European Society of Anesthesiology, Paolo Pelosi, who sadly died two days ago. But uh, we, it went on, and we, uh, this has spread all over the world, this declaration. But a declaration in itself, it's fine. But we need to, to do what it said in order to make an impact. So the work was not done. And then, 10 years later, we were writing a book about the, about the different uh, roles of stakeholders and so. And then they said, oh, we need some, somebody who can talk about patient, write about patient's role. And uh, why don't you write that, Janneke? And I said, shouldn't you rather get a patient to do that? Yes, exactly, they said. Because at that moment, I had forgotten that I was sitting in the meeting full of chemo and immune and so. Because for four and a half years old, at this last, the last summit we had here at Huntington Beach, on the last day on the summit, I felt something was not right in my body. I went home, I was diagnosed with a metastatic pancreatic cancer and being told that I would have a few months to live. Well, I'm still here, as you can see, but... <laughs> uh, thank you. No guarantee, no guarantee. Because, as you can see here, I am in the hospital. Uh, my colleagues are taking care of me. They are using syringe labels uh, on, on the OR lamp when I was in, going for surgery to brighten me up. And, and really, I was a VIP patient. But yet, I had to fight for myself. You know, they, would, uh, they, they, they were the best doctors and so, but they would uh, say, well, hemoglobin is fine. And I would ask, what about the thrombocytes? Oh, well, oh, yeah, they are very low. And I mean, thing after thing after thing, I had to fight. And then you come in this dilemma, which I'm sure many of you in this room will recognize. You want them to like you. You don't want to be difficult, because if you are, you might not uh, get the best treatment. This dilemma you have as a relative, and you have it as a patient. And I had it too. Well, it went well so far. No, no, uh, I mean, nobody has told me I'm cured or anything. But until now, I'm, I'm fine, as you can see. And this is what we have heard today, but this is not new. This is from more, more than 100 years ago, a Norwegian author said, a sick man knows much of which a healthy man has no clue. And what is attributed to Sir William Osler, listen to your patient, he's telling you the diagnosis. And that's so important. The thing is that many of us on the front end, we really don't know how to do that. How can we get that input uh, uh, from the patients in the best way? Well, then we have from Kaiser Permanente, who have done the four good habits, which is a tool for all of us, which we can use as healthcare workers. And in our hospital, all doctors and nurses are trained in that tool to help us deal with the patient. And the first is invest in the beginning. And what they did in the hospital when they just started that was to build this for, uh, for uh, the OPD. And uh, what kind of an investment is that to get to know your patient in the beginning? The second is, uh, is elicit the patient's perspective. And then it was also in our hospital, I felt so uncomfortable that when you talk to a patient, you are standing there and the patient are lying there and it's a very, very unequal situation. So if you have that foldable stool and you go from bed to bed, you can sit down, you can meet the patient eye level. And just these small things can make things easier to elicit their pers uh, perspective. And also try to figure out what happens to them, what worries them. We cannot expect that the patients will tell us. We have to, it's our duty to find it out how we do. Then the, the third, uh, third is demonstrate empathy. And I have felt from so many of my colleagues they are afraid of showing emotions. They are, afra are afraid of being so-called unprofessional. Well, I can tell you, I have shed more than one tear with patients and relatives. That does not mean that I'm unprofessional. That me tells them that I am a human being who cares. 
And there was once this patient, I will have had maybe six months of anesthesiology during the summer holidays, and, um, and uh, he had uh, a leak in his esophagus. I was looking after him in the ICU. And then he said, well, next time I have surgery, I'll have the best anesthesiologist. Please, can you provide anesthesia? Well, after six months, you are hardly the best anesthesiologist. So, uh, I mean, it just illustrates how, how important it is that you show them that you care. The fourth habit is to invest in the end, but I'm not talking about that. We heard about Justine Michalitsi several times today. And what is Justin, and, and what's very special with this story, I think, is that her mo his mother didn't know what happened. She tried for years and years and years to find the truth. And after almost 10 years, the story, there was a doctor who said, I can't live with myself anymore. I had to tell you what happened. And uh, he, he died when he was, uh, was uh, draining a swollen ankle. And they gave him, by a, a mistake, phenylephrine instead of fentanyl. And if you look at the... At, uh, <laughs> At the ampules, this is from my hospital, it's very easy to take the wrong ampule if you are in a hurry, just from the looks of it. And what the, the, what the mother said is, although this physician's informant's information was troubling, it was also healing. You see, parents blame themselves when something happens to their child. It was our duty to keep him safe. No, honestly. When he, they, he has been taken over in our, our care, it's our duty. An example from Norway is, a, is a, 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 another person who tried to commit suicide by slitting his throat, came into the ER, uh, he was intubated, but then the tube was dislocated and he died. And then, no, no, we don't, we don't report this. I mean, nobody outside this room should know anything about it. And then after three years, Rumors went, it's a small town, and so, so then uh, there was investigations made. And then what turned out was that the truth came. And then this boy, Alexander, for three years he thought he was the person to blame for his father's death, as he had not remembered the 9-11 number correctly. This is our fear of being open. What are we so worried about? It's, it's really bad, and I think this is an old version of the Australian open framework. Imagine the last time something went really, really wrong. Imagine that it concerned your wife, child, mother, father instead. Imagine the conversation you would have wanted to have with the doctor, the team, and the management. It's simple. Simple. Obviously not. I'm turning, I'm turning a little bit here to, to uh, what is being worked on here on the National uh, Healthcare Investigation Board. Because back in 98, I was the president of the Norwegian Society, and we worked with the air, air ambulance, all of us, so we all had to go through crew management training and so on and so forth. And then there was a colleague who wrote this, why don't we get that kind of non-punitive uh, investigations? in healthcare in Norway. And uh, that's a good idea, I thought. So we brought that idea forward. But no, it was very hard to get listened to because we were healthcare or we were doctors. And as you know, doctors, the only thing we care about is our own wealth and power and so. So they didn't, want, they didn't listen to us. And then once in a while, we would take the same thing forward. And then it happened. Ten years later, or more than ten years later, relatives who had lost their loved ones, they had to organize themselves, and, and they demanded the same thing. And in, I think it's a disaster. I mean, it's really a failure when the relatives have to organize in themselves to be listened to. That should go without any organization, or it should be a, a, a done thing that we listen to them. But anyway... So one of them uh, was her, uh, that was the mother of a daughter who had died uh, in, from preeclampsia in my hospital. And the hospital wanted to do, do everything right afterwards, but that included not talking to the relatives when the healthcare board 
uh, was looking into the matter. They thought they might disturb things. So that created a big thing, and they demanded a similar uh, uh, in, an investigation board. And then by coincidence, the same day, I had taken a new initiative. And then the, uh, the relatives spoke with the Minister of Health, I spoke with the Minister of Health and others, and we got it in 2019. Again, demonstrating when forces coming from different angles working together, we can get there. Unfortunately, now there is a, a movement to get rid of it. And so I will now need your help here in the United States to push for the Norwegian government to keep it. Okay, a few words uh, uh, now about uh, looking at the new fashionable things to look at things, the safety to concept, that we should not look at things that go wrong, but it's better to look at things that go well. Okay, you can see here it has gone well. But if you look back where it starts, how can you know when it starts which of those lines that will end to go well? I mean, it's very difficult. So it, it's, it, it's fine that we praise each other and help each other that things go well, but yet we must never stop to look back and see what barriers have to be in place in order to prevent things to happen again. We owe that to people. And then the culture is important. This is my, my, uh, my first professor and role model. He's making waffles to all the staff here. And he, when I was trained, he would ask the most stupid questions. And I thought, why are you asking those stupid questions? You're the professor, you should know these things. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but then it turned out the reason why he asked those stupid questions was to make us feel safe to make any questions or pose any questions at all. And that is how to make a safe uh, culture. And I would say here, we, we in the department, we know that things happen to good people. Even the best uh, can make mistakes if things uh, around you uh, are, uh, are wrong. So and another thing is that culture, it can't go to the top. Uh, only if it's the top management and the President Burick, as we have heard earlier today, and so that we have to, on the top, and I would say that uh, to, to people, and they would say, yes, but my boss is horrible. I mean, I can't, I mean, I can't use him for anything in culture. And then, yes, but you still are responsible for yourself. So if you are working in a very tough system, still you have to do what you can in your own system. So what he also introduced was that we had learning incidents where no patients had been died, they were not even harmed, but they could have been. So then we discussed, because for every person who dies, there are several that are harmed, and then many, many others that could have been if we had not done. So we had using those incidents to learn from them as well. I'm approaching the end finally, but I think we have heard uh, uh, Don Burick earlier today. This from the uh, Staffordshire scandal. Involvement means having the patient voice heard at every level of the service, even when that voice is a whisper. Very true. And it, we are not listening to be nice. We are listening, of course, nice is fine too, but it is to help provide better care and service. And also, seek out and listen to colleagues and staff. And I think that's another thing we at the front end. I've been, I've been a doctor now for more than 40 years. It gives me some competence. But sometimes you feel it's not very welcome because it disturbs what these people on the top have done and so on and so on. But we have knowledge that other people do not have. So this advice to seek out and listen to colleagues and staff is very important. And then finally, I would give my kudos to the WHO and all the group that what they are doing. Again, describing how all stakeholders have to come together, how every small piece had to come in place and to make plans, commitment on a total different scale that we have seen years before. So with all of that, I'm hopeful. I know we can get there together 
uh, uh, towards a, uh, a safer healthcare. And this is my hospital. It's not photoshopped. We can get to the bottom of the rainbow. Thank you very much.